Welcome to our Distinguished Lecturer webinar series. My name is Kerry Cosby, and I'm the Chapters Manager at the IEEE Computer Society. I oversee our more than 500 professional and student chapters around the world and manage our Distinguished Visitors program. I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping tasks. You can ask your questions in the Q&A uh, panel, and Dr. Rajaraman, uh, Rajaraman will answer as many questions as he can following the presentation. When you're writing your questions, if it's relating to a particular slide, please do your best to reference that slide. The webinar is being recorded, and the slides and recording will be made available after the webinar. Today's discussion is past, present, and future of computing. I'd like to introduce our speaker, speaker Dr. V. Raja, Rajaraman, is Emeritus Professor, Supercomputer Education and Research Center, India Institute of Science, Bangalore. Earlier, Dr. Rajaraman was Professor of Computer Science and Electrical Engineering at IIT Kanpur, Professor of Computer Science and Chairman of Computer, Supercomputer Education and Research Center, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and IBM Professor of Information Technology, Jawaharlal Nehru Center for uh, Advanced Scientific Research. A Padma Bhushan awardee in 1998, he's also a recipient of the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar uh, Prize in 1976, the Homi Baba Prize by UGC, Om Prakash Basan Award, the ISTE Award for Excellence in Teaching Computer Engineering, Rustam Choksi Award, the Zahir Medal by the Indian National Science Academy. He's a lifetime contri contribution awardee of the Indian National Academy of Engineering and Computer Society of India. He received a DSC from IIT Kanpur and the Indian Institute of Engineering, Science and Technology, Shibpur. Shibpur. He is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Science, Sciences, <clears throat> the Indian National Science Academy, the National Academy of Sciences, the Indian National Academy of Engineering, and the Computer Society of India. Dr. Rajaraman, I'd like to pass the floor to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kerry Cosby, for your kind introduction. I also thank Kerry for teaching me how to use this ON24 system to make my presentation. I also would like to thank Mr. Richard Mohan of IEEE Computer Society Chennai chapter for having persuaded me to give this talk. There's an old saying, saying the flesh is weak, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So my spirit is quite up, but I'm not as young as, as I used to be. So please bear with me. I started being, started the computing profession in 1955 by building nonlinear units for an analog computer at the Institute of Science, Bangalore. This analog computer solved nonlinear differential equations and was made using tubes. My next, next work with computers was um, in 1957 when I programmed the IBM 704 computer in assembly language. In fact, in the first class I attended, the teacher said that there's something called Fortran in the horizon but it's too advanced for this class. So in fact, I started writing programs in a language called Share Assembly Programming Language. And um, it is quite a, a lot of work getting one program running. It took about three days. And I was not very happy because in analog computing, it is interactive. And as I change the parameters of a, a problem, I could instantly see the results on the, on the screen. I 
I'm going to <clears throat> make my presentation on the history of computing as a set of breakpoints. By breakpoint, I mean um, that there are landmark years when the direction of the growth of computers and the applications changed. The first such breakpoint occurred in 1977 with the advent of personal computers. Till then, computers were in large halls and we had to go to the computer. And when personal computers came, the computers came to us on our desk. So that is a big change in the way in which computers were used. The next break point was the intertwining of computers and communications. With that went up Ethernet and the advent of internet, the entire scenario changed in the sense that computers no more isolated. They're all interconnected and formed a network, both local and international. And that had a huge impact in the way in which computers developed after that. The next point, the break point, came with the advent of wireless connection of computers. Wireless connection essentially allowed us to take our computer anywhere and, and from, we can use computing from anywhere and um, from any, uh, with, you know, with, 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 without any tethered, being tethered to a, a stationary machine. Uh, it's followed by the advent of cloud computing where computing now became a utility. In other words, you don't have to own a machine to be able to use it. You can sit in your home and to a machine maintained by somebody else, and um, you can uh, use it uh, and pay for what you use. In fact, there are a whole lot of cloud computing applications which are free. We've all been using email, and email is essentially run on a cloud computer and has been free for quite some time. The next break point was the rebirth of AI, I say, because AI, even though it started in 1955, had a period when uh, it did not advance because of the non-availability of powerful computers. And um, it got resurrected with the advent of a huge amount of data being available on the internet and a huge amount of computing power being available from the cloud. And in fact, I, I use the year 2011 as a landmark year because that is the year when the IBM Watson machine beat the human uh, competitor in a game called Jeopardy in uh, the US television. The game was very interesting in the sense that it gave you an answer and uh, you had to give a question corresponding to that answer. And um, it required a fair amount of knowledge about not only current events, but also phraseology and um, some aspects of the English language. When you look at computing, you can um, <clears throat> divide it into, into an, its components. The processor, a main memory, a secondary memory, input-output, programming, operating systems, and applications. These have <clears throat> remained invariant over the years. In fact, the one Neumann architecture of a stored program computer has been there with us from 1955 till today, even though <clears throat> there have been attempts off and on to try to come up with new computer architectures, they've all not been very successful. And we still continue with one Neumann architecture. This picture shows a mainframe in the era between 55 and 77. You can see a room full of units whole number of tape drives, uh, a big processor, 
a, a disk drive here, a printer, and a card reader. And um, this used to take up something like 20 to 30 kilowatts of power and um, occupy an entire room. And you had to wait for two or three days to get a result of the machine. In fact, when people talk about computers, you look at it as so-called generations of computer. The first generation was starting from the early days up to <clears throat> 1960, when tubes were the major components being used. Then in 1960, the transistor came along and computers started using transistors. In fact, the IBM 704 was a tube machine, whereas 7040, the next, next model, well, use transistors. And when ICs came in 1965, a third generation computers came where the component used was integrated circuits. And the fourth generation came with the advent of integrated circuits with a large scale, where, where in one chip, more than about 100,000 transistors were put in. So. The generation started with tubes, transistors, integrated circuits, and large-scale integrated circuits. And the early computers, the main memory was core, core, magnetic cores, where a whole lot of cores and were there and were strung with four wires per core. And this lasted till 75. And the secondary memory were our disks, which are considered fast. This is an <clears throat> interchangeable disk, which is, of course, similar to what we use today, except that this disk is, has only two megabytes. Uh, in fact, the largest disk available in the early disk computers was a RAMAC, which was 20 megabyte disk. And uh, this is a tape drive. These tape drives, of course, you can continue even now for archival storage, but with la much larger storage capacity. Input was through punch cards, and you punch a card at various, you know, there's a, something called um, ten, 10 rows and 11th and 12th rows and 80 columns. And you create a deck of cards. Each, each card contained one statement of a program, and the entire deck was used as a program. And also, paper, punched paper tapes were used, and of course, uh, printers are used output. Printers, they are is used even today in banks and so on. But I, mostly printers have become much smaller, and they are now mostly laser printers. The earliest assembly pro programming language was an assembly language, as I said, uh, up to 1957. 57, there's a big break with the invention of Fortran by John Backus. Fortran, in fact, <clears throat> made a big change because um, people who are afraid of using a computer because of the great amount of difficulty of having to learn about the computer's internal structure to be able to use it changed, and one had to only understand how to write an algorithm and how to translate this algorithm into a, a language. And um, the Fortran, which came in 57, is still alive and kicking. And uh, the current standard is Fortran 2018. In fact, in 1982, <clears throat> Tony Hoare, who was awarded the Turing Award that year, said that I don't know what the programming language of the year 2000 will be, but I know that it is still called Fortran. Uh, how pro prophetic was that? Was that? And uh, Fortran is still used for, by engineers and scientists, particularly in many supercomputers. COBOL was the next high-level language, which was uh, designed by the Conference on Data Systems Languages, primarily for business data processing. It descended from a language called Flowmatic, 
designed by Admiral Grace Murray Hopper, between 55 and 59. And um, you may be surprised to know that cobalt is still used. And I was surprised to find that currently there are uh, 1.5 billion lines of cobalt core which are still being written today. And there are 220 billion lines of cobalt core which are working in mainframe computers, particularly in banks and financial institutions. In fact, the entire credit card system in the US would come crashing down if COBOL programs are not properly maintained. In Algol came in 58 as a, a, a replacement for Fortran because Fortran was, did not use any good language features and it was quick and ready language. And Algol tried to kind of correct it by giving it a good grammar. But unfortunately, it did not have any vendor support and the compilers which are written for Algol were very inefficient, with the result that it died. BASIC came along in 64 and was used in the early days of personal computers. Pascal was <clears throat> modeled after Algol and used in education institutions for around 10 years. C was invented in 73, Berici at Bell Labs. C was a lot more efficient and became very popular. And uh, it is still used very widely. An object C came up in 1985 and is still widely used. In the past, the operating system started with batch operating systems. And the first time sharing operating system was uh, designed by Fernando Corbato and his team at IBM, for, at, the, at MIT, for the IBM 7, 709. The machine had 32 kilowatts, 36 bit per word. In fact, the word byte had not yet been invented. And uh, 36 bits per word was used because each character <coughs> was coded with six bits. And it, the machine did not have a, <coughs> a disk and uh, was using tapes. And in spite of that, Corbato was able to write a time sharing system. And uh, next major effort to improve it was an, initiated uh, with a Multix project at MIT, which um, in fact was a joint project between uh, MIT, Bell Labs, and General Electric G, G, which gave the computer 645 on which the Multics was written. The whole idea of Multics was to try to <clears throat> have much better um, human computer interaction. In fact, Lick Leider wrote a very famous paper in, the 19, in 1957 talking about the need for uh, the interaction between humans and computers to be able to use the computer effectively. And um, in fact, he was the one who supported this project and gave the money for this project. But the Multics operating system became a little too large and it, it also took a long time. And in between, Bell Labs withdrew because um, they had planned that the project would take about two years, but it dragged on for five years. And Thompson and Richie, <coughs> who were uh, <clears throat> part of the team, came back to Bell Labs and they were very unhappy using the system there, which is still a batch-oriented system. And so they, they went ahead and designed their own time-sharing system and called it Unix. And uh, it became very popular in 77. And versions of Unix are uh, used even today. In fact, the um, Apple computers, all the Apple Mac, uh, Macs and so on have Unix. And many of the modern computers have Unix. And of course, as you know, Linux and Ubuntu and so on are very, very popular with personal computers. The major applications in the early days 
course, our scientific computing, uh, libraries of common programs written for solving simultaneous algebraic equations, and many of the computer intensive jobs in uh, computational fluid dynamics, structural design, and so on. And uh, concurrently, there is activity in uh, business data processing. And uh, Charles Bachman came, came up with the in inter integrated data system when the first disk came along. And um, this was a, the first database management system. And for his effort, he got a Turing Award. And um, <clears throat> this was a proprietary database system. So the Conference on Data Systems Languages wanted to standardize DBMS for use by all computers and came up with a codicil DBMS called a network model, which used a lot of pointers. And in competition, IBM, which was dominant in those days, came up with the information management system in 1969. And um, it was very popular at that time. And there was a lot of fights kind of going on between the codicil proponents and DMS proponents. And um, in, the, in, the, in the meanwhile, Edgar Card in 1970 came up with the relational database management system and relational calculus to put the database management system in a firm mathematical footing. And um, IBM was not too happy with, with this, and they didn't adopt it, but a, a system R and a, a query language called SQL was developed by a group at IBM Research Lab, led by Chamberlain and Boyce, between 73 and 79. And this was a very, very good system. Even though IBM did not support it, Oracle took it up and started to, started to market it. And they made a very clever <coughs> change in writing the RDBMS in the C language so that it became portable. And Oracle became quite, in fact, uh, their success was based on the RDBMS. AI started quite early. In 1955, John McCarthy coined the term when he um, called for a conference of um, people to look at how computers can be made to be a little bit more intelligent. And um, he got um, a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. And who is who in uh, AI attended that conference and the term artificial intelligence was coined by him. And as a consequence of this, the logic theory, theorist program to prove theorems was written by Alan Newell and Herbert Simon in 1956. And um, Lisp was written by McCarthy in MIT. And in fact, chess playing programs were, were in fact um, uh, popular even in the early 50s. In fact, the very first chess playing program was written in 1950 by Shannon, who wrote a, a paper about it in the Philosophical Magazine. But, um, and then many people went on to try to improve the chess program. But only in 1997, the program and the computer technology improved to an extent that a computer could beat the IBM the IBM Deep Blue could, could be the champion Kasparov. Neural net simulation was uh, proposed by Michelot and Pitts as early as 1943 as a mathematical model. And using this, a uh, single layer network called Perceptron was built by Frank Rosenblatt in 1957. It was unfortunately oversold. And many people said, we are now. Um, computer which can think. And um, Marvin Minsky and Papert showed that 
This is good there for Seth Trump had a lot of shortcomings because he could only recognize what are known as uh, linearly separable functions. The first digitally operated robot was built as early as 1954 and was used by GM in 60. And Weizenbaum came up with a natural language program making a psychoanalyst. The program was very interesting in the sense that it start off with asking question to a, a user and uh, it'll ask, how are you today? And the user says, I feel very, very depressed. Then it'll ask again, why are you depressed? In other words, like the program effectively put back the answer back as a, as a different question and went on with this. And in fact, many people thought that it is a, a language which is almost a, like a psychiatrist. And uh, the first attempt at understanding speech was by Raj Reddy, first at Stanford, and later on he continued in CMU with a program called Yersey. And early work on speech processing, computer vision, and pattern recognition went on in the 70s, 70s. And in fact, the 80s, saw the advent of expert systems, which um, was in fact um, started off when the Japanese proposed the so-called fifth generation knowledge-based computer systems. And um, examples of um, expert systems were a system called Mycin, which was used by doctors to prescribe, the, uh, prescribe antibiotics, the correct dosage, depending upon the symptoms. And many decision problems, particularly diagnosis problems of both machines and um, people were used by expert systems. In fact, I saw recently a COVID advice program using a simple expert system and, uh, to diagnose how to, how, whether you have COVID or not. The personal computer era started off, as I said, with the, the 19th of 77, with the trinity of three machines, Apple, Apple, Apple is the first, and then followed by Commodore and TRS. And um, this, uh, as I say, changed the no, revolutionized computing because now computers came into homes. And, um, the personal computer was given relevance and small businesses started using IBM computers in 1981 when um, IBM came up with their PC. In fact, the um, IBM had a deadline of one year to come up with the PC and um, the first time that they decided to outsource many of what they did internally and uh, they outsourced the operation, operating system to uh, Bill Gates, MS-DOS, and um, uh, the, all of you know the uh, rest of it is once Bill Gates got it and then a whole lot of IBM clones started coming, then um, the IBM's dominance slowly went down. But in fact, in the early days when IBM machines came, businesses bought these IBM machines because the managers just say nobody got fired for buying IBM. Over the years, the PC software has remained same. There are generations which have come, starting with MS-DOS and various MS Windows and up, up to Windows 10, and Apple's DOS up to current, current Catalina, which is actually Unix modified. Linux and Ubuntu, game software, in fact, gave PCs a lot of impetus, an office software suite, which we use every day. And uh, currently, the office software is on the cloud. So you can, you don't have to buy the office software. You can use it and pay as you use. The present computers have become very, very powerful. In fact, there are 
The processor has 40 million transistors per chip, multiple cores, parallel processing, built-in caches of almost 100 megabytes, which one never dreamt of in the early days, built-in graphic processors, built-in wireless network interfaces, uh, accelerators, uh, but the clock rate is still limited between three and four gigahertz because the circuit gets heated up as you increase the clock rate. And uh, cooling is one of the biggest problems in uh, these new processors. So a lot of research is going on in low power solutions. And over the years, the number of transistors in chips have been doubling every two years. But are we coming to the end of that doubling, which is called Moore's law. Um, currently, the technology is called seven nanosecond nano, um, <clears throat> nanometer technology. And um, that is the, the line size around seven nanometers that almost approaches the size of, um, of, of, of molecules and so on. So there's going to be quantum effects which may arise at a very small sizes. And so one would not be able to reduce the size anymore, but one is going to three dimensions and so on. And um, general purpose graphics processing units with 50 billion transistors <coughs> are now available. So originally they were main, meant for graphics, but now they are being used for uh, solving linear, simultaneous linear equations and as co-processors in many supercomputers to give them their, <coughs> their high speed. Present computers have main memory of 128 GB, all solid state, DRAM, secondary memory, the largest, largest hard drive is about 20 TB, and secondary storage is one TB and maximum is eight terabytes. And archival storage are still tapes called LTO Altrium, Altrium 30 terabytes compressed. It's called Generation 8. They have now worked up to Generation 13, and each generation doubles the uh, compressed storage. And uh, the tapes still survive because of the, of the fact that the life of um, bits stored in tapes have over 30 years or so, if they are stored in reasonable, reasonable environment. And of course, cloud storage is now available, and uh, you can get as much as you want, depending upon your willingness to pay. Now processors are everywhere. Chips are found in uh, aircrafts, in automobiles, and uh, and um, every, every one of your uh, devices, like, like television and um, uh, ovens and so on. And uh, in fact, even um, structures like bridges have built-in processors to find out how they perform over time. And, and in, Internet of processors is there to so-called small smart cities, and networks of processors are control home appliances, and most medical diagnosis devices use processors. In fact, they're all called cyber physical systems because the cyber essentially meaning that they have processors. Whenever processors are there, it's supposed to be people call it intelligent. Cost of processing have been going down very rapidly. As you can see, in 1980, a gigaflop cost $5 million, and today it costs one cent. And one megabyte cost $6,000 in 80, and 2020 it is $003. And a GB of uh, this storage was 300,000. In 1980, it is two cents now. In fact, cost uh, halves are almost every two years. The processing cost has come down more rapidly because of the use of GPGPOs, general purpose units in, in supercomputers. 
input devices uh, currently are mainly keyboard, mouse, trackpads, touch screens with laptops. Graphical inputs use icons, point, point and click, drag and drop, scanners, digital camera, accelerometers, just gesture recognition, speech input, and brain computer interfaces. I give you some pictures of them, like just for a keyboard, a mouse, and for a game, gaming computer, the handheld uh, controls, and this is a brain computer interface where essentially it works the same principle as electro EEGs, uh, electroencephalograms. It picks up brain waves and does control. And there's a, a, a book scanner, which uh, companies like Google use to scan books and put it in the, in the, in the, in the internet. Output devices currently are uh, Video screens, speakers, zero displays. Um, color laser printers. And now, of course, this is a 3D uh, virtual reality um, head mounted display. And this is a 3D, um, 3D printer. Um, 3D printer for additive manufacturing. Multimedia came of came away between the 1890s because of availability of faster processors, improved input devices and output devices, interactivity. In fact, interact interactivity was the most important part to for the graphics to come uh, become popular. Uh, images, audio, video, besides text and emojis. Uh, <clears throat> a digitization and compression of multimedia is now very common. And uh, this has been the emergence of standards like JPEG, MP3, MPEG, and so on, are the ones which have made the, uh, the multimedia uh, popular and easily exchangeable between people. And currently, we see computer-generated realistic images, computer-generated speech, and um, MIDI interfaces for musical instruments, and full-length movies. In fact, the first full-length movie was made in 1995, called Toy Story. So I see this is a computer-painted, and this computer-generated teapot. This is a, from Toy Story, and these are images which are really, really become, in addition to char characters, they are now become part of the character set of many computers. Okay. Intertwining of computers and communication in 1983 changed the nature of computing. In fact, the big important idea was that of Paul Baran and Donald Davis, who said that um, a long strings of data should be cut up into small packets, and they can be sent through different lines in a, in a network and reassembled, and that would make the telephone network, which are existing at that time, a lot more efficient. In fact, the work at RAN was done to make computer networks quite reliable in spite of uh, nuclear attacks it was during the Cold War days. And communication became digital from analog <coughs> for both data and voice. Packet switching was used in ARPANET the first wide area network in 1969, which used the telephone network in USA. And LAN and Ethernet protocol was um, designed by Metcalf at Xerox Park. Xerox, in fact, Xerox Park was the first uh, company to come up with a, a desktop, not really desktop, it's a, it's a personal computer. That is a computer, uh, on every, every, which every user can use as his own. 
and uh, the Xerox management wanted all these computers to be interconnected and gave that job to Metcalf, and he came up with the Ethernet protocol to interconnect the Xerox Park parts computers. And he wanted to make that a standard, and he was successful in um, persuading Digital Equipment Corporation, Intel Corporation, and Xerox to cooperate and uh, standardize the Ethernet protocol for lo local data network. And this was later on picked up by the IEEE, and he also persuaded IEEE to, to adopt it as the IEEE 802.3 Ethernet standard, which is still there. Various, well, the first standard was called A and B, and they have been going on like GN and so on. So there are a whole lot of standards, and the and um, the speeds have become higher and higher. And um, the internet came in 1983 with the invention of the TCP IP protocol by Winton Cerf and Bob Kahn. And this, uh, of course, was a huge revolution. In fact, I would say that probably, probably internet is the one most important revolution of the of the 20th century, which um, changed the society entirely. And one of the reasons why the internet has progressed is because communication bandwidth has grown very fast. In fact, telecommunication bandwidth doubles every, day, every, every two, six to nine months at constant cost. So the, the um, three, three things kind of conspired together to um, make what computers are today. One was the Moore's law, which made processors power powerful every two years, reducing the cost, keep you know, doubling the power of the machine at no extra cost. And um, storage, which is doubling almost every 18 months. And uh, bandwidth, which is also doubling every nine months or so. All three together is really what made a big change in computing. Consequence of the internet, of course, are email, worldwide web, browsers, search engines, video and audio on demand, or Netflix, Amazon, all those things wouldn't have been possible without the internet and the bandwidth cost reduction, YouTube, e-commerce, Internet of Things in cloud computing. All consequences of internet. It also brought along with it security problems of viruses, worms, spam, spyware, hackers, they don't, they don't have service, cyber crimes, and so on. The next big revolution or a break point was in 1999 when computers were became and got untethered. <coughs> this was brought about by the foresight of the Federal Communication Commission of USA, which uh, opened up the industrial scientific and medical bands. In the uh, 900 megahertz, hertz, 2.54 gigahertz, and 5.8 gigahertz, for communication. Before that, they were usable only for scientific and medical industrial reasons. Once they were opened up for communication, those bands could be used for uh, sending data. And this led to the, uh, the emergence of Wi-Fi the, and the IEEE 802.1.11 season standards, starting with 10 megabits per second in 1997. And um, in fact, uh, Apple computers provided the first five Wi-Fi transceiver card built into their uh, Apple computers in 1999, so that um, now <clears throat> laptops could be moved around and could, could log on to internet or any other computer. Um, so the advent of laptop was in fact due to the 
availability of Wi-Fi. <clears throat> the current 802.11ax standard is, uh, is 11 gigab gigabits per second on fiber optics. So it's a, it's a huge increase in speed between 1997 and 19, 2019. Wireless LANs and wireless access through routers to the internet. It, in fact, it's a, in the any time, anywhere computing. The, after the Wi-Fi came, the um, mobile communication came along. First, 1G was all analog, and 2G and 2.5G started using digital communication. And um, with 100 kbps uh, digital data ca carrying capacity, uh, the, the first uh, computer to start using that was BlackBerry. 2002, which has become very, became very popular with um, businessmen because they could send email with a keyboard, you know, with a machine which they can carry in their pockets. And with the advent of 3G in, in, 2000, in 2007, Steve Jobs got a brilliant, brilliant idea of uh, cooperating with at and and um, coming up with a smartphone. Smartphone, he said, it's a, it's a phone out of the world and not get to do anything apart. In fact, it, it can also be used for talking. And in fact, it's now being used for uh, almost everything, including talking. Okay. And um, <clears throat> feature-rich 5G smartphones are now available. And as I said, talking is incidental. And you can use it for audio video recording. There are several cameras. The idea of selfies came along. And next there's WhatsApp, multimedia, messaging. And in fact, smartphones have become an essential gadget today. And uh, cost of mobile data has also reduced considerably. And that's one of the reasons why Smart smartphones have become very popular. Um, I picked up from Try Data, 2014 cost per GB download in India was 268 rupees, and today it is four rupees. A reduction of 56 folds in six years, almost halving every year. And um, now you know the, the it's a dirt cheap uh, mobile data in India, and um, this has made almost a bit, a, a, everybody carry a smartphone. Cloud computing was the <clears throat> next um, important breakpoint. <clears throat> Amazon was uh, using a huge computer system for their e-commerce work. And they found that there is a whole lot of excess computing capacity available, which uh, was not being used. Because they had to cater to maximum demand. Like for e-commerce, the maximum demand was during Christmas time. Whereas uh, during other times, uh, that, that, that capacity was unused. So um, Amazon's got the brilliant idea Jeff Bezos, that why not use an excess capacity and uh, give it on demand to people. And, um, and he came up with Amazon Web Services, and that opened up the um, uh, cloud computing <coughs> market. He can, there are, uh, sorry, he, cloud computing is, uh, there you can either they use infra, infrastructure as a service, so you can get uh, the storage which you want, or processor you want, whatever you want. And this is a great um, uh, boon to startups, because when they start, they don't know how much of computing power they'll require. As they, if it becomes very popular, very quickly they can scale up. And um, so similarly, storage availability makes it very <coughs> effective 
as an infra availability infrastructure and software as a service. In fact, email is one such service where um, <clears throat> the software system is provided by the user and you by the cloud cloud provider and the user uses the the software. In fact, uh, Salesforce was one of the first uh, companies to use this kind of an idea. And platform and service, where you, you get not only the infrastructure, but also the operating system and everything which goes along with it. <clears throat> Main features of cloud computing is pay for computing and storage and demand. Uh, Virtualization, which is necessary because you may use any any kind of an operating system you may you would like to use from any kind of a, uh, a client, and um, so the the machine should look like the, the type of machine you would like to have, and uh, so effectively it takes different different avatars depending upon what you want, and in order to manage all these avatars you got a hypervisor. And uh, the clouds are divided into private cloud. If you want to have a cloud system of, which is entirely for you, like for instance, banks, which value their, their security, would not like people to snoop on their data, and they use private cloud. And public cloud is something which, you, you know, if you want to keep your website, it is a, it's not the way it's, can be put in cloud. And the hybrid, where <clears throat> some private, what secure and what you consider not so secure and uh, can put in the public. And um, the cloud computers use what are known as warehouse scale computers. That is, there are a huge number of cards, processing cards. They're all stacked up and cooled, in fact, by a lot of cooling um, system uh, with cold water circulating. And they uh, you, you take up uh, gigawatts of power. In fact, many of the cloud storage providers put their computers in places like Alaska and Colorado because they're cold and their air conditioning cost will not become high. In fact, one of the... Um, cloud computing system, uh, Microsoft tried to put under the sea in a huge sphere. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, you can put, put a huge uh, warehouse scale computer in, in a sphere and put it in, under the Atlantic only if you are sure that it will not fail at all. In other words, the mean time between failures should be so huge and the redundancy must be so high that you, the, you don't have to worry about having to repair it. So whenever something goes wrong, it always uh, shift over to uh, another processor. Now, people are always worried about getting um, stuck with one provider. And if you don't like the provider, then you would like to change over. And if the provider has got proprietary software, it's very difficult to do so. The people are talking about federated clouds, so that it's kind of it becomes a, a, a cooperative system with all the cloud providers having common standards. There's not a come, but we hope that in the long run it will become some so a cooperative like large power systems and become a truly a utility. And uh, one big problem with clouds is that uh, you don't know where the computer is situated. If it's situated outside your country, and um, they can be snooped on by even governments, and uh, you, you won't have security. So, um, and um, there's a lot of legal problems. If something happens in a machine outside your country, you can't take them to court because it's uh, it's outside. And so now many governments want the cloud to be in their own country. Uh, for particularly for government users. Last break point is the resurgence of AI. <clears throat> Availability of huge amount of data and expensive processing power. 
and led to the multi-layered neural networks, which are a lot more, much better than single-layer network, which started off in the early days. And uh, with very good algorithms uh, designed by Hinton, Rubel Hart, Likon, and Bingio, uh, we have come to a stage where recognition problems have become very easy. And AI research has been resurrected. In fact, uh, IBM's Watson, as I told you earlier, beat the reigning champion in 2011. Awesome. Consequence of AI resurgence is automation, routine work, improvement in sensors, recognition software has led to many types of new robots, driverless cars, and so on. Programming languages at present, uh, Fortran, Object C, and C++ still continue, and languages from the web design are, are continue, and uh, scripting languages have emerged, like JavaScript, Perl, Python, PHP, and Ruby, and so on. R is used for statistical computing. Functional languages like Haskell, Erlang, and Scala are, um, are very good languages, but not used by many. It's like Sanskrit, chanted by a few high priests and used, not used by a common man. A dangerous to great future um, in a ra rapidly evolving field. And um, uh, clock speed as um, beyond forehead, he hurts the <coughs> so heating is too much. And exploration of non 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 Bohemian architectures like data flow have not been very successful. Um, mainly, parallelism is used in technology. Quantum computer promises there the qubits, where zero and one exist simultaneously, and um, they solve very difficult optimization problems. The only problem with uh, quantum computing is that um, the it's very non-intuitive. You can't really think of something like zero and one existing simultaneously together. This is because of some quantum effects called um, <clears throat> entanglement. And um, this um, idea of entanglement and um, superposition are difficult to understand. And um, so writing algorithms uh, using for, for these computers are quite difficult. And uh, the largest computer which has been built is 53 bit, 53 qubit Google Sycamore. And may become available in 10 to 20 years. It's optimistic. Um, major problems are very low temperature operation. The work are almost near absolute zero. And um, the noise problems are very high, uh, very, very finicky. A little bit of disturbance will make them unreliable. And um, this is a qubit computer. Uh, future processors, photons are used in communication extensively. Um, they increase the bandwidth. Can they be used in processors? But um, it has not been possible because you no know, photon gates are yet available. And uh, extensive research has not yielded commercial success. Need for new materials to make photonic successful. Uh, gallium nitride to replace silicon has got high power density. Problems are with purity. Carbon nanotubes based on graphic are experimental. And nanomagnetic logic is uh, uh, manipulated magnetic states and uh, with nanomagnets is also not very reliable currently. Uh, deployment, of course, are mainframes, personal, and, and currently, of course, they are entering our body because small processors are being put inside to monitor body parameters. Uh, data storage, <coughs> main memory, will continue for the foreseeable future. Secondary direct access store, 100 TB, enclosed in helium um, is predicted for 2025. Archive memory will continue to be bank tapes. And um, main problem is stability, because tapes can store up to 30 years. 
future data storage systems DNA store, DNA stores I mean encoded, they can store 2.2 petabytes per gram. Only problem is they are too slow. And but then the storage is perpetual, it's extremely expensive. Ultra sh short pulse layer, pulse layer laser etching data and system blocks have been tried and st storing 360 terabytes. And magnetic race track memories are being tried with nanoworlds and holographic memory. People have been talking about it for a long time with no real success. Uh, increasing use of contain, contain, containerized applications deployed in clouds, specification oriented languages. What we would like to have is uh, to say what you want to get done and let the computer figure out with the help of AI and machine learning how to do it. And um, this um, is, uh, in fact, I saw one demonstration of this recently of um, a person giving an order of write, write a program to find out whether it's a palindrome or not, and the machine comes up with a program to do it. Use of computers now, universal distance is irrelevant, and variable companion. Innovative robots are coming around. Many uses in medicine, surgery are still to be invented. It's up to one's imagination. We have to use the power wisely. So to conclude, <clears throat> from being a number cruncher in 55, computers are now become invaluable companions in our daily life. Pocket-sized computer is now available to access information, play games, and so on. Breakpoints, I looked at the breakpoints which made the, this possible. Concurrent advancements, storage system, I.O. digitalization, compression, and so on, has contributed to the current state of computing. It is difficult to predict the future, particularly in a fast-changing technology like ours. New devices are on the horizon, quantum computing, photonics, matter nanomagnetics, and so on. Specification-oriented system design is in the horizon. Uh, AI applications will prolifer proliferate, and we need to use technology wisely. Thank you for listening. Sorry for my voice, which is not held up, because it has been a long time since I've given long lectures. So I'll take one or two questions. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Rajaraman. Your voice has, uh, has been perfectly fine. Don't worry about it. You did a great job. Uh, we do have a lot of questions actually coming in uh, that I'd like to, to read some of them for you. Um, one person says, please comment on novel applications of lower bandwidth tech, SMS, for example, to allow access to commerce when smartphones aren't supported. Mostly low, low, low volume, uh, low, low, uh, low frequency is primarily being used in um, underwater work as well as um, in the, in the naval communication. Long waves, long waves are um, have the problem of long waves is that the antenna size has got to be very large, and uh, if you want to have a smartphone in your hand. The antenna size has got to be very small. And we, by force, we have to use a small uh, geometry systems. So I don't really see how long wave can be used uh, for, uh, uh, for mobile communication with, with smart, small devices. This next one is referring to your slide number 38. Um, it says, what about big data and associated hardware and software? Uh, 38. 38 is programming language. Um, but he wants to... Uh, what story is it? What, what, what is the question? 
Which, which lady wants? They want to know. They uh, are asking about. Uh, they say, "What about big data and associated hardware and software?" Oh. Okay. There's money for that. Oh, for everybody here. Um, big data, because there are two requirements of, um, of big data. One is um, the immediate access, which you, and then one is the, the other is the uh, um, storing it in a backup device for a long period of time. As far as um, the um, immediate access required, you have currently uh, the SSDs. SSDs can go up to, uh, as I said, two, two terabytes or so. Even um, even a pen drive has come back to one terabyte, uh, uh, pen, pen, pen drive. And um, with two terabytes of SSD, you can kind of stage it. Uh, you can have three stages, archival, which is on tape, and uh, our disks have something which you need access as a kind of a backup, and then uh, SSD or something which you require immediately. In other words, you use a hierarchy of storages, then the faster data which you require immediately can be taken from the, the um, cache-like uh, system, which is uh, in the, uh, up front, namely the uh, SSDs. And they have a follow-on question of, would you agree that AI would not have been resurrected if big data had not evolved? Definitely. I mean, without the availability of internet and a huge amount of data which got accumulated, the internet. In fact, the data was given by you and me through emails, through exchanging pictures on Facebook, and so on. So users contributed a huge amount of data uh, to the internet. And all these became available to researchers to work on. And then at the same time, the processing power and the advent of GP GPUs at a very low cost made it possible to analyze all this huge amount of data which is available. So the conspiring of the availability of what I would say sample data set, which is uh, ran into uh, um, terabytes and petabytes and um, uh, processing power, which also ran into teraflops, made it possible to experiment with multi-layered um, networks and train them in reasonable time. Uh, you can't train them in reasonable time, then uh, none of this recognition would have, would have been possible. So I, I would definitely agree that uh, without the huge amount of data available on the internet, the current, uh, uh, current um, status of uh, <coughs> recognition wouldn't have been possible. All right, thanks, that's great. Uh, the next question is, this person wants to know how best to use cloud computing to protect us against hackers. Against? Hackers. Oh, oh, oh. That, that, is, uh, um, that is up to you to some extent. So there are two, two places where uh, the, the problem can occur. One is the between you and the cloud, and the other is within the cloud. Hopefully, the cloud provider has enough security to prevent any kind of a hacking in the cloud. There, there we have to trust the cloud provider. As far as the between cloud and you is concerned, you got to be very careful about encrypting what you send with really reasonably strong encryption. So that um, also encrypt the data which you store in the cloud. Unless you encrypt the data which you store in the cloud and with reasonably good encryption, if, if a person is able to get hold of your disk, he can kind of retrieve it from there and decode it. 
but then bankruption hopefully will not happen. So I said, the only good solution is to have good encryption algorithms and make sure. And many of the <coughs> security problems arise not only because of hackers, but of, uh, because of internal um, indiscipline in the, in, the system, in the organization itself. So you want us to be careful about standard operating procedures and so on, and uh, to prevent hacking and um, careless use of the cloud. Okay, thank you. The next person wants to know your views on data formats and long-term storage and the reuse of information. At present, data stored in different versions of Windows OS are not comparable. That's a perpetual problem. And, uh, uh, well, um, in databases, we have uh, we have tried to kind of see there are, there are two two levels. One is the uh, data structure as it's stored in the device, and the data structure as it's available to you as a user. So we have a good method of kind of re for having a user view which is kind of invariant uh, from the uh, way in which it is stored internally in the machine, then this problem will be partially solved. In other words, you, know, you have to have uh, an intermediate uh, a layer which, which kind of transforms the um, um, incompatible format to format which is kind of uniform incompatible. Um, the... the next question, or actually this is a, a clarification, I think. The person who had asked about the uh, novel application of lower bandwidth SMS says that they were referring to, for example, access to consumer banking in remote areas of Africa and India via flip phone because the data comm infrastructure doesn't support bandwidth needed for smartphones. Uh, they state this is driven by the bank's need for a need to support a wider number of customers and not become a classist influence. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think the, the bandwidth available um, it's quite, see now what, what has happened is that up to the, 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 at least in India, the government plans to have fiber optics up to every village level. So um, the uh, huge amount of data that need to be sent is sent on the fiber. And uh, within the, the last mile connectivity is always through some, some local wiring system. So, and also uh, mobile mobile communication is possible for the last last mile. A last mile mobile communication has been a number of uh, research work that has gone on to try to make it um, inexpensive. And um, I think there are there are solutions which are available. I am not an expert in this area, so I won't really be able to say an authentic answer. Okay, this next person says, would you like to comment on the fact that data generation capacity has outstripped the data storage facility by at least a factor of 10? Um, I'm, not, uh, um, I'm not very convinced about it because the storage sizes are increasing and cloud storages have become quite, very, quite large. I mean, there people are worried that if you end up with the zettabytes of data over the years, it's a question of being able to back them up. And uh, Altrium tapes are quite large. And of course, the, as I said, one um, possible uh, long-range solution is the DNA storage. So DNA storage has on, almost in, in, in infinite capacity to store uh, data except that they are very slow. So primarily, if you want to have uh, archival storage, as you, for the long run, then you probably have to put it in in, um, in that kind of a, a DNA-type storage, which is in the horizon. 
but not uh, uh, not not um, there's already people have uh, designed DNA stores, uh, but uh, very expensive at this time, and they are perpetual. And but then there, there is a huge capacity per gram. You can store two point two petabytes. I'll take one right, more very question. Good. I think we may take about. Two more. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking also. Um, the last question then is any thoughts on technology being used in chips which are injected into human bodies for trafficking, or sorry, for tracking attendance, uh, individuals, banking information, et cetera. Do you think it's safe to have this kind of human machine combination in technology? I don't um, like the idea of uh, chip being in, inside you to identify you, okay? But uh, I, I like the idea of a chip being inside you to uh, say, for instance, uh, give you a, an insulin shot uh, whenever your sugar goes down. Mm -hmm. So there are there are there are uh, systems of that type which are embedded in people, you know, to you know, to help them uh, for better health, but for identifying them and so on, it's too much of, it'll become too much of a um, uh, intrusion into one's privacy. Very good, and thank this, you. I mean, the amount of intrusion which is happening, because every time you uh, you send an email, um, the provider knows what you're saying. And uh, all of you would have seen that any, any time you do a, a search, um, ne next time you go for a search, there's an ad selling you something. Okay, so already we lost a lot of our privacy. Uh, I don't want us to lose it, lose more of it by embedding something in ourselves. Thank you very much. That was a great answer. Um, I'd like to take this moment to thank Dr. Raja Raman for your presentation. You've done a great job. I think everybody has really enjoyed it. You've given us a lot of things to, to think about. Um, the history of computing and the future of computing is definitely something that we need to take into consideration um, for everything that we do. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you for attending. Uh, you've been a great audience. The questions have been wonderful. And last, I'd like to thank the Geographic Activities Committee Region 10 for their support in putting this presentation together. Our next Distinguished Lecturer webinar series is going to, webinar is going to be on the 5th of November at 6, uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on digital signature and IP steganography for securing hardware accelerators presented by Anurban Sengupta, Indian Institute of Technology, Indoor. In addition to the Distinguished Lecturer webinar series, we also offer the Build Your Career webinar series that focuses on business soft skills, such as communication and presentation skills, career transition, interviewing tips, among others. Our next Build Your Career webinar will be at 11, on the 11th of November at 11 a.m. on Stand Out from the Crowd, resumes that will get noticed by employers and interviewing skills that get you hired. That'll be by Susan uh, Kathy Land, uh, U.S. Department of Defense's Missile Defense Agency. Registration is now open and we will be sending you a link to these future events along with the slides and recording of this webinar. Again, thank you all very much for coming and Dr. Rajaraman, thank you again. It has been a great presentation. We've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Leave note.